There is no serious religious or spiritual path anywhere throughout history that gives any of us a pass on addressing the suffering of other sentient beings. You can't skip the crucifixion and go right to the resurrection. That's not transcendence. That's Mm -hmm. denial. Life is all about relationships. Lovers, family, body, or money. How satisfied you are can be completely explained by how you relate to things around you. This is Sophie Jaffe, and together with my husband, Dr. D. Jaffe, we are here to explore and teach you how to maximize your relationships and achieve a happier life. Let's get ignited. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Ignited Relationship Podcast. I'm Adi Jaffe. And I'm Sophie Jaffe. Episode 100, y'all. Woohoo! We, we did it. it. We, we did it. You guys have no idea what this started out like, <laughs> like talking to these, to our phones in, uh, in the garage where we were at before. Yeah, it's, it's, we've come such a long way. And at the same time, although we're so much more organized and we have a bigger team, it still feels very organic, natural, not forced, um, not super professional. Like it's still just us hanging out I'm in a, our home. I'm a pro. Yeah, you are. Full on pro. Yeah, but I feel like we're still, we're so, although we're at 100 episodes and although we've upped up our game and we have bigger guests, it it still just feels like you and I having conversations, which is the best part. Totally. And just wait, y'all, until you hear today's conversation. Um, I want to start out by doing the things we do. So I want to read our review of the week. The most inspired. I feel the most inspired when I listen to you both share deeply. Every sentence elevates me. That is the truth, exclamation point, two exclamation points. I am so thankful for your message, your vulnerability, and your power. And that's by uh, Lauren M. Fedway. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much. I love when you guys send me an email or a DM and you say, you read my review today on the podcast. Mm. I like, freaked out, almost wrecked my car. It was so cute. Don't wreck your car. Don't wreck your car. But love the feedback and please continue sharing. That's how we grow. Um, we're totally grassroots at this point, just word of mouth. So please just share this with a friend, share this with a family member, um, post it on your social if you feel inclined to, and just say what it is you love about listening to Ignited. Just be genuine and authentic. And um, if you haven't given us a five-star review and just written something about what you love about us and Ignited, please let us know um, in wherever you listen to podcasts, actually. Absolutely. And um, in a couple of days, we've got our first event. In-person event. Glow is happening if you listen to episodes on this podcast and you love our guests, this is like pretty much your dream come true in person in LA. Um, and I mean, Shaman Dirk, Alexander Rock, so like all the busy gold, all the people, the guests that have done the most amazing episodes with us here are all joining us. And we it's have be local incredible. vendors. We have like amazing, like anything that you've seen me wear and love, like electric and rose or the things I drink and the things I eat. We're going to have perfect bar there. Obviously my favorite bar in the world. I've been literally eating perfect bar for 10 years. Like our fridge is stocked fully with perfect bar, but it always time. has been. Yeah. If you think about it for 10 years, when they were super, super small and just starting out in San Diego, I was one of their first, like they would drop stuff off to me. I would send them some philosophy. Like I've loved them since I used to do those cleanses back in the day. And I would drop, they used to get a perfect bar with every cleanse day. Their almond, the almond one that I love is the main one. That's how they started, right? No, they started with peanut. Is it peanut butter? That's yeah, their, their dad, There's they have a ton of siblings. I don't want to misquote it, but they have a ton of siblings <laughs> and like seven siblings. And the dad used to make these peanut butter protein, mm. they're not like protein bars, but like peanut butter amazing ener- energy bars. bars. Yeah. And then they were making it in their kitchen. And now so I love, I love the almond personally. It's like, I gotta tell you guys, that's Kai's I'm, favorite too. Is that his favorite? Yeah. When I walk out of the house, I grab one of them just to make sure I have it out because I get busy and I run around and sometimes I don't have the time to eat on well, the yeah. run. And the refrigerated bars, just so you know, they're that's how like potent and pure they are. Is that they are perishable, but you can throw them in your bag for a couple of days and they'll be fine. Like yeah, just that's so why you know. I don't keep them in my car, but like I'll. I'll grab one on the way out because yeah. that way for a few hours they're good. Exactly. Love these things. So we keep our fridge stocked and um, whether you've tried them or not, these guys are going to be all over Glow 
Yep. You can they're literally gonna be stuff fueling, your face. Fueling everyone with these delicious bars. And, and they're a little like they're now little, they have chocolate peanut butter cups. Oh, it's brand new and chocolate. they're delicious. If you love peanut butter cups or like Reese's, like this is the way to go because it's healthier and just so delicious and nutritious. I am obsessed with perfect bar. So kids love them. That they have will the kid be there. size. It's gonna be oof. Yeah. That will be there. We will have my favorite juices there, my favorite workout clothes, my favorite yoga mats. Like this is a manifestation of a DNI and ignited and what that represents and beauty and skincare and natural, you know, everything. Reiki, um, Arana will be there doing talks and also moon readings yes. and just everything. Rochelle and I from Nour Nourish Your Soul, we have a retreat actually next week in Sayulita and we'll be teaching, co-teaching a class. And so if you want to just hang out for two straight weeks with Sophie, you can <laughs> come to Glow and then go to Mexico with her. Yeah, I think we have like one spot left. But yes, you could definitely sign up for that one spot and come to Sayulita or you can catch us in LA at Ignited Glow and take a class with Rochelle and I. So much magic. I Amazing. mean, I'm just so excited for next week. But the focus here is our guest, which is Marianne Williamson, um, presidential candidate. Candidate, and you have a you have a quote from her that you love. You've always loved it. You've loved it since almost since I've met you. Oh yeah, this quote is amazing. So I've read this one other time on the podcast, but there's <laughs> no redundancy here. Always mm. room for this quote and more of it. I read this in my yoga classes all the time. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Love that quote from Marianne. Absolute magic. How could you not want to live in a world <laughs> in a society where that is truth, where our president says and utters words like that? I mean, nobody's perfect. I'm not saying that she's a perfect human being. That doesn't even exist. Um, what we really wanted to show here and share here is the humanness of Marianne. She's not a effing robot. <laughs> She is a human being having a human experience and trying to come from a place of love instead of fear. And I think that's that's kind of maybe what has gotten lost over the years in the entire political thing. And I get it to some extent, but, you know, we talk about it all the time in this podcast that people are not perfect. Nobody is perfect. You know, I just I shared with you this morning when I did the podcast with Ruby, people were kind of like, mad and people can regularly get mad at why I'm not apologetic about the fact that I still consume alcohol. And I'm like, look, I'm not, I'm not trying to be perfect. Never have. I stay out in the sun. I eat chocolate. I, you know, I love sugar in my coffee. I don't try to live perfectly. I try to live in a way that satisfies me and make me, makes me happy. And in the political process, I feel like we've gotten to this really crazy place where people have to be perfect all the time. She actually says it in this interview, one wrong word, one wrong phrase, um, I don't know if anyone remembers this, but there, there was a presidential candidate that uh, he later became the head of the DNC, but he yelled wrong in one talk. Yelled, he made like a hee-haw, like mm -hmm. a, it just didn't come out right out of his throat. Right. Done. Yep. He lost the race. And um, she's aware of that. She even says in the interview, like, I could make one wrong move and I'm out. Yeah. And she tries to be herself, which... I have to honor to some extent. And and also what I love about this interview with Marianne is you followed her before. Of course. So you brought this awareness into it of who she was before she started running. Exactly. Which, you know. And I did. I actually wasn't 100% supportive of this presidential. I was very wary of, of sharing anything until I got to really speak to her and, and find out what she was, what her messaging was. Because just because someone's a good spiritual leader doesn't make them a good president. Yeah. But she actually, as you'll hear in this interview, stands on two grounded feet, is very 
strong, knows what she's doing, and is learning from other people's mistakes and her own. Yeah. Which is all we can do. We live in such an interesting time, right? The kind of the old political guard is wavering. It's just, it's not... It's not delivering like it used to. It um, People are not trusting it as much. And so it is really interesting what it opens up the conversation to. There's no way that this kind of spiritual leader, somebody that leads in the, in the way that Marianne speaks all the time, would even have a platform to talk right. unless it was these times. Um, but we talk about that. We talk about what made her run. You know, this is, you know this, Soph. I know it to a lesser extent. But when you have a public platform, Anything you say gets scrutinized oh, yeah. so insanely. And to open yourself up to that alone, I mean, I see it in your work, like the things you're willing to share, the things you aren't, the things that you will talk about off screen that are different than how you present them on screen, just in terms of the the backlash. Right. Um, you know, not necessarily changing your opinions, but rather which ones you bring front and center. Exactly. And when you run for office, you don't really have a choice. It's kind of just like it's all out there. Yeah. And um, people love to focus on the things that they want to focus on and then let that be the thing that drives their vote. That one topic. Well, it's been it's been shown many, many times in research. I'm reading uh, these books by uh, Robert Cialdini, who's a, a social psychology expert. We don't really make decisions based on the logic of anything. Right. We just don't. None of, none of us do. Never have. It's so much on how things get emotional. structured and the emotional connection. And, and then these really interesting biases that get created for us, right? Um, and so I wish I wish Marianne the best in her campaign, whether she wins or not. Is It's refreshing to have this sort of voice. Absolutely. But I also have to say that for me, having this interview was um, was powerful because... I got to tell you guys, you know, when we started Ignited, the goal was to get you all in on very personal, very deep conversations. Yeah. And this is one of those. It just so happens to be with a presidential candidate right. for the U.S. highest office. And to get her to speak about the things you you talk to her about motherhood. I mean, it's surreal. It's surreal that she's made it this far. And I am honored to witness this yeah. in our lifetime for yeah. our children and for ourselves. Yeah. And for those of you who are in my space in recovery and mental health, you know, we went there a little bit on on questions of the people are in my world are not necessarily super comfortable about her, but I wanted some clarification from her yeah. and it was great. I heard parts of her story that I'd never heard before. Yeah. Um, here's to me, we're going to, by the way, we're going to try to get you some more candidates on the podcast yeah. so that you can, you know, if you're listening to us, if you are into our way of kind of looking at the world, which is let's get transparency out there. Let's get honesty. Let's stop this double talk bullshit. You know, I mentioned the 1984 book. Yeah. And making changes. Let's let's help make changes. Let, yeah. let our demographic make the changes for our next generations. Yeah. We all got excited when Obama got elected because of that concept of we can change the world. And then we look, bottom line is we found out how hard it is to really change the world. That doesn't mean you stop. No. Just because it's hard to do something. I deal with this with clients all the time. You and I deal with this in our relationship. Just because something fucking hard to do is not the reason to stop doing it. No. Actually, it's the opposite. It's the reason to double down and yeah. figure out, well, what didn't work last time and what will work now yeah. better? You know, Obama opened the door. He cracked the door open to conversations we weren't mm -hmm. having before. How can we get back in there and do the work? Yeah. Um, I'm honored. I'm so happy to bring this episode. Um, you know, to me, it's... It's the culmination. How beautiful that it ended up being our 100th episode. There are no coincidences. There yeah. are no coincidences. Everything happens as exactly as it's supposed to. Yeah. And, and by, just so you guys know, this it wasn't planned to mm -mm. be the 100th. Mm -mm. This happened last second. We were been trying to get Marianne for like two months. And then... More than that. When yeah. I was in Maryland, she finally said yes. So yeah. that was... Five, six months ago? Yeah, it was Leo's birthday. July. Yeah. And so then three days before we recorded this episode... They go, hey, she's got a spot exactly during this time. She's in New York. Can you do it? Great. Let's do it. Book it. And then, oh, wait, isn't that our 100th episode? Maddie um, figured it out. Yeah. Go, Maddie. All right, guys, let's let you listen to this episode. We are so grateful for you. Come to Ignited Glow on Friday. Send us an email or DM if you want to come and it's sold out. Um, and we'll make sure you get to get there. Amen. See you all on the other side. Bye. All right, everybody. We know you're really excited to get to Marianne's interview but cups of coffee in hand, we just had to tell you about 
these amazing, amazing mushroom blends that honestly we put in our coffee every single morning. We do. They just make it so easy. We love Four Sigmatic because they have little one serving packets that you can tear open and add to your matcha, your latte. They're adaptogenic mushrooms and they barely taste like anything. They don't really change the flavor of the coffee, but what they do is they make you feel so good, more energy, the lion's mane we add every single day to our coffee. Yeah, every every morning when I make Sophie's coffee, it's got a non-dairy creamer, lion's mane, and cacao magic, and our, you know, like ground beans of the week. Yep, and, and we every week. also bring Four Sigmatic when we travel. So no matter where I am in the world, I have a few packets in my backpack, in my purse, because it's so easy on the go. And if you want to try Four Sigmatic and get some adaptogens in your life, you can use our code IGNITED. That's I-G-N-T-D. Seriously, guys, if you don't know how to spell IGNITED yet, then... You're fired. I, I, I don't know what to do with you. Well, you're, you're not fired. quite fired. Like <laughs> press the subscribe button and just keep listening. But yes, I G N T D is the code. We love these guys. We had Taro on the podcast. The podcast. That's how much we love Four Sigmatic. Go listen to his episode. He's we'll a put his man. episode in the show notes so you can go back and listen. He's an incredible human being. Absolutely. Bye, guys. Bye. This episode of the Ignited Podcast is brought to you by Philosophy Superfoods. The Philosophy offers cleanses and other nutritional products that are unlike any of the other supplements and detoxification programs on the market. Why? Because they actually nourish the body with whole, live, nutrient-rich foods instead of depriving you and leaving you hungry. Have you ever tried a cleanse only to find out that you can't make it through a whole day because you're starving? Ever try a superfood shake that made you nauseous because it was so disgusting you'd rather not eat? The Philosophy fix all that with a simple set of offerings that load up your body with nutrients while actually tasting good. Makes sense, right? Each of the Philosophy superfood and protein blends is vegan, raw, gluten-free, and has absolutely no filler ingredients. With over 15,000 satisfied customers, including some of the world's biggest celebrities like George Clooney, Gerard Butler, Leah Michelle, and over 10 years of experience, this is the best stuff you can get. To buy some or find out more info, go to our website, thephilosophy.com. Welcome everybody back to the conversation piece of today's podcast. We have you know, I say this every once in a while, but we have a ridiculously, incredibly special guest here today. We've got Marianne Williamson in the house with us. Thank Woo-hoo! you so much for joining us, Marianne. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm going to have Sophie tell the story a little bit of how she um, she found out about you and the connection that we had, and especially Sophie had over the last five, six years, um, because I think I think it's important. But I wanted an icebreaker. I know you do so many interviews right now running for president. So we wanted, we wanted to start the conversation a little bit differently than probably most CNN or MSNBC conversation you'd be having right now. Um, <laughs> if you have to sing karaoke, what song do you pick? I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> and, and you will and you have. I love it. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us. It's magical knowing you over the last five, six years and your previous run for Congress and seeing this iteration is really, really incredible. Uh, and so really thank you for making the time. Thank you. Soph, do you want to talk a little bit and then let Marianne introduce herself to all our amazing people? I would love to. So I've been following Marianne's work, your work for, I don't know, probably about five or six years when I became friends with Jamie, who's our mutual friend. And She's just like, you would resonate with this woman. You would love, come with me to a talk. And we went to talks in LA. It was right around the corner from our old house. And, um, and you know, I'm in the, I'm a yoga instructor. I'm, you know, I've, I'm in the world. I'm in the world of wellness. It's, this is my, my thing. So it's not, it takes a lot for someone to like stick with me and keep me inspired because I am around this all the time. And your work throughout the years, I keep coming back. I, I, we have three kids now. So when I was super, super pregnant and miserable and sick, I would just stream your, your live stream, um, in our kitchen while I'm making the kids dinner. And it, you know, it really just, it, it anchors me into really what's important in the world and the work that I'm doing and the, the future I want my children to grow up in. So thank you so much for your work. And 
I am just so honored, honored to have you today. Well, thank you so much. And I'm honored to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. Um, it really means a lot to me. And I see you on Instagram, so I know about your beautiful children and your beautiful work and your beautiful body and your beautiful family. And <laughs> oh, it's interesting, my mother was named Sophie. And when he oh. called you Soph just now, I hadn't heard that since mm. I would hear my mother say, hey, Soph. So I feel a special bond with you, just that. Mm. And, uh, thank you. It means a lot to me. I think that um, we've always got to keep moving. Always got to keep moving. And I think that you will find that in your career as well. You know, um, you can get frozen. Um, and I think the marketplace makes that an easy temptation. Mm. But you'll pay a price for that ultimately because you'll stop being relevant if you don't keep moving. Mm. Um, but thank you. Well, you moved a lot. Speaking of that, uh, I, we found out some things in research that I didn't ever know about you. Seeing you or listening to what you put out, um, you're from Texas. Yeah, I am from Houston. Originally, um, Texas is apparently the third largest listening state we have for this podcast. So what? I thought I thought that was really interesting because I never knew that about you at all. Um, yeah. If you don't mind, for our sense. listeners, some of them already know who you are, and some maybe this is the first time they're finding out or they found about you through the presidential race. Do you mind telling us a little bit about how a girl from Houston, Texas, ends up doing what you now do and had done even before the presidential run? And maybe then finally, I've heard you speak on this, how you got to this place where you decided to run for president. Well, I grew up in Houston, as you said. And when I was growing up, back in the late 60s and the early, in the se early 70s, like when I was in college, we would read Ram Dass and Alan Watts and do all these spiritual things in the morning. And then we would go to anti-war Vietnam protests, anti-Vietnam war protests in the afternoon. So for my generation, the, 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 the transformation of the 60s and the 70s was all those things. It was political and it was spiritual and it was cultural and it was sexual and it was musical. There wasn't this sense of these different categories. Things weren't, didn't seem to be in such distinct lanes. You, you, you were a whole human being and it was recognized that all those things were part of life. So that that has always been my sweet spot, that it's outer change and inner change. Now, in terms of where my personal devotion went, in terms of how I might be of value in the world, because I started reading The Course in Miracles when I was uh, in my 20s and had such a passion for talking about the principles of universal spiritual truth that are, a, that are part of that book, that are the essence of that book. That's where things went for me. But from the beginning of my career, like very early, um, the AIDS crisis burst onto the scene in Los Angeles where I was working. So for me, addressing the sufferer on the outside has always been as important as addressing my own need to just be, become a better woman to the best of my ability. I've never seen the distinction between the two. So I was majoring in, in, in my work, majoring in spiritual transformation, but always minoring in political activism, starting uh, Project Angel Food in Los Angeles, uh, the Peace Alliance, being on the board of, of results for end hunger and poverty, uh, hosting the Sister Giant Conferences, hooking women into, uh, connecting women to political activism and electoral politics. It's just that once Trump got elected, you know, hmm. until Trump's election, I think there was a level on which we could just speak from the outside. We could speak from the periphery. But I believe now that those of us who are involved in, like you were saying, Sophie, health and wellness, we have to deal with the health and wellness of our society because it's not going to, you know, good luck with all that green juice and good luck with all that gluten-free when there's so many mm. contaminants in the water because they have overturned the Clean Water Act and so many contaminants and toxins in the air because they've overturned the uh, Clean Air Act and so many toxins in our uh, uh, soil and no matter how much you might be protecting your children because they're allowing the sale of certain pesticides, they could be putting them in the yard down the street from you and there's nothing you can do. So we can't, there's no public issue that won't ultimately get to our private door. Mm -hmm. And also I'm fascinated by the fact that when you look at the narrative of the, the through line of American history, 
it was the, the abolitionist movement arose from the early evangelicals and Quakers. And many of the, the leaders of the uh, uh, women's suffrage movement were Quakers. And of course, the civil rights movement came from the Christian, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Dr. King, a Baptist preacher. So when you actually look at the great moments of, of cor uh, course correction in American history, where we had so swerved from the mm -hmm. tenets of democracy and social justice that there had to be a fundamental, you know, course correction. To be honest, it's always come from people within spiritual and religious uh, communities that said enough is enough. And mm -hmm. I believe that, you know, those of us who who are involved with health and wellness and spirituality, we should be the biggest grown-ups in the room. We're the last people who should be standing on the sidelines because if you know what heals one heart, you know what heals the world. And then the last thing I'll say about it is if the women of America, particularly the mothers of America, aren't going to show up right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know how much you adore your children and I know all you're doing for your children, but you're living in a protected environment and none of us will be protected from what the chaos that will ensue if this stuff really explodes. Mm. And we know from the work that we all do that this is going to take a spiritual as well as material solution. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. It's a constant discussion, we'll call it, with me and some friends that don't, you know, they're moms and they just want to stay out of it. Just want to stay out of it. Just want to stay out of it, you know? And, and in, in, the wellness, in the wellness movement as well, I have yoga teacher friends when the election happened where I was like crying on camera and just heartbroken and they called me out and said, this isn't your place. You're supposed to be positive. <laughs> like, well, what are you doing? So this is what you tell them. <laughs> there is no serious religious or spiritual path anywhere throughout history that gives any of us a pass on addressing the suffering of other sentient beings. You can't skip the crucifixion and go right to the resurrection. That's not transcendence. That's mm -hmm. denial. Mm -hmm. You can't skip the, the slavery of the uh, Israelites in Egypt and go right to the promised land. That's not transcendence. That's denial. As a spiritual teacher, no, your role is not just to be positive. Your role is to know that in, in our lives, just like in our bodies, detox means stuff has to come mm -hmm. up and out. You can't, you know, it's interesting because in our community, we, we talk about how you can't do a spiritual bypass. Yeah. Why, why would we do a spiritual bypass in, in the larger world? Mm. So right. You're doing it for you to be crying the tears of a broken heart. Yeah. It sometimes is the role of the spiritual teacher to demonstrate. And the idea that a spiritual teacher is someone who's become so stuck in denial and brand protection. By the way, that's another thing. Exactly. What's really going on there is this little capitalist uh, thing going on. It's what's yep. really it's not a dedication to spirituality. It's a dedication to brand protection. That's yep. how it's corrupt. Uh, do you mind? Do you mind if I totally? If I ask you because of the examples that you just brought up, do you think that that need for correction, that need to right wrongs or protect or um, reconsider and change the perspective on what it is that's good for humanity, and and then do the hard work to correct. Do you think that that's limited? I understand that it's been driven by it uh, historically. Do you think it's limited to spiritual and religious origins or that there's something within us that brings out that need and the desire to help and do good even outside of that? Well, I think that's the spiritual part in all of us, whether someone calls it spiritual or not. Someone could totally not relate to the word spirituality or religion or anything like that. And we all have an innate goodness, like you said, or yeah. I believe that 99.999% you know, of the world does. So yeah. it comes from that place, which is not of itself um, categorized by all people within a spiritual context. However, what religious impulse does give us and I'm not saying it's the only thing that gives it to us, and I'm, yeah. once again, it might not be called by that, is a refusal to be quiet when truly wrong things are going on. That's just human conscience and human courage. So, no, it comes from, uh, doesn't necessarily come from those communities. It comes from that place in the human heart. On the other hand, I think it's worth noting how, as I said, in, in the course of American history, just how interesting it is the role that those communities have played. Yeah, no, no, definitely. It's one of the things that I'm, um, 
I wonder about, because I also see the other side a lot of times, right? And I see religion being used as a, um, oh, of course, as a tool to bludgeon uh, of course, those and who are needy. The status quo. I mean, look at the evangelical right wingers today supporting uh, the president, et cetera. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that synopsis of kind of how you got to this and the role you see yourself playing in. Because, you know, I mean, let's be honest about it. Running for president is not an enjoyable experience. I mean, you say it's not an enjoyable. It doesn't look from the outside like an enjoyable experience. If anything, you know, this month, which is what I think is so amazing, this is going to be our 100th episode on a month where our theme is bullying. And A, I know you've talked before about A, our uh, commander in chief right now, and his status as essentially an adult bully. Secondly, maybe America's role in general sometimes as a bully in the world. And then there's a third perspective that I think fits in, which is the amount of bullying you've received since joining the fight. Mm. And, and it just seems like such a perfect theme. storm theme to fit in to, you know, bringing yourself under fire like that. Well, I think you're correct. Um, some part of it is a lot of fun. Mm. It's both exhilarating and brutal when I'm actually out there talking about these things, I mean, there's no platform like a presidential campaign for discussing the things that matter. And Martin Luther King said, your life begins to end on the day you stop talking about things that matter. Mm. So the very fact that I can talk as a presidential candidate about what's wrong with our economy, about the things we were just talking about, about our environmental toxins, about reparations, about traumatized children, about war and peace, about the need for a World War II level mass mobilization to reverse climate change. It is exhilarating to have this opportunity. And when I'm actually talking to voters about those things, I just feel so blessed and privileged. Now, in terms of the bullying, you're right, I really have. Uh, it's been, um, we're living in very mean-spirited times. Mm. Uh, you're guilty until proven innocent. And a bifurcated time, a time where if somebody expresses a view that is even slightly disjointed from your own, it's almost like we've all fallen into this hyper-protection mode where we now have to pounce and... Unbelievable. Yeah. It's not like, oh, I disagree with you. It's you shut up. Yeah. This shutdown mentality is so horrifying. And we're all a bunch of emotional fascists these days. <laughs> it's not enough that, oh, Ms. Williamson, I don't agree with you. It's you drop out now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, excuse me. And then, uh, you know, lies. And, you know, I'm anti-science. You know, I'm <laughs> Jewish. I go to the doctor. This idea that I'm anti-medicine or anti-doctor or, you know, mm. anti-science or crazy or, I mean, I'm, I'm used to a career where people would come hear me. I'm not your cup of tea. I'm not your cup of tea. You don't come back. But I don't think anybody would leave my lectures thinking I wasn't a decent human being or yeah. that I was a, you know, I, I and it's, um, and it's meant, of course, to diminish you and mock you and marginalize you so that you won't be taken seriously, which really makes me wonder. Well, I must have, I must have really scared some people that they got quite that activated. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Which is great. But the, <laughs> um, it's just idiotic. Some of the things that people say, not just about you, but just out of fear. It's 100% out of fear. You're bringing things up in them that makes them feel a certain way. There's also a clinging on uh, from my, you know, my world of, I, can't, I went to high school in a very small town, um, you know, one traffic light in Boonesboro, Maryland. And some of my more democratic friends who have moved to bigger cities are now in DC or what have you. Um, you know, they're very strong Democrats. And to those people that I'm just viewing, I'm just witnessing from the outside because I'm in LA. So, you know, I'm like, I'm a crazy now. Uh, so what I've noticed is that I think it's out of fear in that way that, that there's no way someone that believes in crystals and believe, you know, that is in the spiritual world could possibly win. It's not even that there's an anti against your values or your more, it's more like 
we need a candidate that will win. And this like argument that like, but what about a candidate that we want to win? Like, (laughs) yeah, I'd like to speak to all of that. First of all, no one has ever seen the word crystal in any of my books. No one has ever seen me with a crystal on. <laughs> it's it's a total. It's not even that someone who believes in. What does that mean? Believes in crystal. That's a total caricature created intentionally. Yep. Mm. So that's number one. This is darker than it appears. That's number one. Yeah. Number two. This is how I feel about this. What it will take to win thing. Mm-hmm. So those people that you're talking about are saying we need a qualified. Excuse me, we had that last time and we lost. Mm -hmm. And look who won. Yes, and look who won. So this is the deal. Donald Trump is not just a politician. He's a phenomenon. If we just approach this campaign with traditional political strategy stuck somewhere in the late 20th century, I propose that we are going to have a more difficult time winning. What they, he, his campaign is run by a company called Cambridge Analytica. Now, Cambridge Analytica, they were there last time. They will be here this time. Now, hear me when I tell you this. This is a military-grade propaganda weapon. Mm-hmm. It was designed and created for warfare purposes. It rests on, on techniques of manipulation, triggering, reaction. They deal with, with data even from a shadowy data sources, their capacity to manipulate is unimaginable. And what that level of fear-based propaganda can do is it can dismantle reason. Mm-hmm. Now, the only thing that can override that is love. So when your friends say to you, oh, she's just silly and it, what y'all are about is so unsophisticated, actually, they're naive, we're more sophisticated. Mm-hmm. We're not we personally, but this mindset is actually more sophisticated because it's positing that a cohesive political narrative based on a loving perspective is the power most able to override him. You tell your friends that the two most successful political movements of the 20th century were the Indian independence movement based on nonviolent philosophy as articulated by Gandhi and the civil rights movement in the United States based on the, on the nonviolent uh, philosophy because Dr. King went to India, studied it, and brought it back. Mm. So the idea that we're just, we're just silly people, we're just silly people. We just don't get the real world. No, excuse me, we're the ones who do get the real world. Yeah, we get that underlying all of this are dimensions of consciousness and psyche and psychology and emotion the fact that the Democrats didn't understand that last time was the problem. Yeah. The fact that the Republicans didn't understand it that time was how they got was how they got um, uh, 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 Trump. So I don't know what these people are so proud of that they have no listening. Hundred yeah. percent. So, so what's happening here is like watching a car crash in slow motion. It's very unfortunate, but once again, so when they say when they say. Uh, we want somebody who can win. I would hope that you would suggest to many of us, we believe she's the one who has the best chance of winning yeah. because yeah. she, 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 pl- it's homeopathic. It's homeopathic. <laughs> He's not just coming from the, from the mind, neither am I. And do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I think we bring more tools mm-hmm. in our, in our skill set. Hell yeah. So yeah, yeah. I mean, people believe that the answer to that is, but she can't win is actually she just might be. I don't want to say the only one who can because yeah. it's so important, whoever the Democrat is. But uh, we have to stand up with a very unabashed uh, uh, confidence we lives. We have to transform consciousness yeah. because we have to do more than just defeat Donald Trump. We, we have to do more than just not go over the cliff. We have to get out of the vicinity of the cliff. And if all we do is defeat him electorally in 20, then those same forces will be back at the midterms in 22 and be back in 24. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about a deeper level of transformation. The fact they talk about crystals and stuff is just to distract us from the depth by, of, of this conversation mm-hmm. by making it appear as though it's shallow. And again, right, I mean, I got, I've got to say, I mean, this feels to me the entire climate, the political climate, the world that we're living in right now feels very 1984-ish. Um, you know, the whole idea of double speak and, and just literally, I don't know, man. Everybody keeps 
writing this guy off as being an idiot. And yet he keeps following and has very particular techniques to make everybody doubt their reality over and over and over so that he gets to write it in whatever way he feels like doing it. And he's using the tools incredibly well. And so, and that's all part of the propaganda machine that I, that I, that I was mentioning. You are absolutely correct. And that's why mom didn't mean to interrupt you, but really. No, no, no. Yeah. And what I was going to say is to bring somebody in who, you can't not play the same game. You have to play in the same game because if you're playing a different game, he's going to keep winning this yeah. one. And what has been shown to us over and over and over is fear mongering. And I'll bring it back to bullying, right? Um, just manhandling and, and, and kind of um, putting down and destroying the, the entire entity of anybody who dares step in your way is very reminiscent of those eighth grade, 10th grade bullies who would just get in their pack and, you know, bulldoze anybody against them. And well, yeah, go on. please. Well, what Sophie was saying before was her friend who would say, we have to have somebody tough enough to fight that. No, we don't. We need somebody who could say, Oh, poor darling. He can't help himself. Can he? Totally. <laughs> poor darling. Yeah. He can't help himself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Hillary's, Hillary's mistake was talking about Trump too much. Yeah. And just well, meeting it with, yeah, exactly. You can't, you have to override it. Mm-hmm. We shall overcome. It's mm-hmm. overcoming. It's, and you can't take on dog whistles because what you're talking about is dog whistles and you can't take, you can't fight them. You have to override them. You have to drown them out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this idea when people say we need somebody who can win, the people who they think can win are going on and on about how Donald, how bad Donald Trump is. I don't know who they're talking to because the people who love Donald Trump are going to vote for Donald Trump. The people who can't stand his agenda are going to vote for Democrats. So who are they talking to? Because the problem there is that those two groups are too close for comfort. We have to talk to millions of people who didn't vote, millions of people who voted third party. And I think also personally, I think millions of people who voted for him but are at least disturbed. But if we go on and on, that's shaming them. Mm. And that's an act of emotional violence. That's not going to make them want to vote for us. You're right. So true. And our way is not like, oh, we're just silly people. Mm -hmm. We're just silly people. We we really have to stand up at this moment and say, actually, you know what? You're the ones whose viewpoint got us here. So we'd like you to step aside right now because we have another. We're taking a different approach here. (laughs) Was there a moment that made you, because you ran for Congress, that was, again, the same sort of in the same milieu, right? Like you have to, you have to surround yourself and worry about fundraising and all the same things you have to worry about that are the less fun part of doing this work than connecting with the people. Was there a moment that made you go, damn it, I got to do this. When I, (laughs) after I ran for Congress, I thought that was over. Um, Scratch that itch. I thought I'd scratch that itch and life goes on. Um, When the idea to run for president came, it took a year and a half to process it. I didn't think it was going to be fun and games, but knowing that if you put your finger in the socket, socket, it, you're going to get an electric shock is still different than feeling the electric shock. Yeah. So the bullying, as you said, and it is bullying, has been, you know, it, it's tough at times, but so what? You know, this is very, very serious business. And uh, I think when you are getting people's support, encouragement, money, uh, you owe it to stand in your strength and just keep going. Yeah. Can I, can I ask this? I'll, I'll ask it maybe as one multiple part question, which you've probably gotten really used to now being on TV. God knows how many times and answering these complex questions, but there are things that you can say and stand for and, and hold firm by when you speak to your audience and have your people come to hear you speak and, and really dig into your viewpoints. And I, I've noticed, and it, it makes absolute sense why, that some of those either don't hold up when you're talking to the entirety of the country or even where the perspective changes and what you need to care about <laughs> because you're no longer talking only to your um, audience, but you're talking to a much broader audience. And obviously one of the things that came up is the, um, the vaccine, um, conversation that was, that was a difficult one to have. Uh, and Sophie deals with it all the time through her work. There's another one that I want to talk about just because of the work that I do, if you don't mind. Um, 
So I work in the addiction field and have for the last 12, 15 years or so. And I know that for a long time, and the spiritual connection makes complete sense to me, for a long time, the, the, I'll call it the program. Everybody, everybody who's listening understands what I'm talking about. What the program um, was something you really stood by and something that you have a firm belief in its power and its yeah. ability to help people. Um, I do work in the field and I work a lot on the alternative side of things. So essentially, honestly, the way it works out in the field is the non, non-AA, non-12 step kind of world. I get into a lot of debates around it. That's probably where I get most of my bullying. Um, I wonder now kind of elevating your platform. Have you noticed that there's support for some topics that maybe were more targeted or worked for a smaller audience, but now things like these, um, they're hot button issues, but also they're, they were really particular to you. They were, um, they were, they were strong issues that you stood by. Have you noticed that your viewpoint changed on those or is it, is it part of the platform? My viewpoint hasn't changed on anything, but we come from a community health and wellness, recovery, therapy, personal growth, spirituality, where deep inquiry and nuance is appreciated, where the paradoxes of life are understood, where you hold two things simultaneously, and that's where the inquiry, however uncomfortable it might be, Mm. actually exists, where it's understood that nobody has a monopoly on truth, where it's understood that there's this and then there's also this, and wow, we must sit here and think about this. Politics is this nasty sport too often, where just tell us what you think, just tell us, you know, what's your position? And And it doesn't... Uh, contain a space for nuance. Now, what I notice, however, is that there are millions of people who want the nuance, who want the deeper inquiry, who want the more sophisticated conversation, because they understand that nothing less than that will transform this country. We are living in very turbulent times, and shallow thinking will not navigate them. It, it, we must be deep thinkers in order to navigate the times in which we live where you're not worrying about being right, you're, you're worried about discerning truth. And that's what we need in a leader. That's what we need in a president. And what I see that the system does is it turns people into cardboard boxes. We become, everybody, you know, my you know, fellow candidates, who are, they're afraid to say anything because one thing, and they're right. I've learned they're right. You say one little thing, or you tweet one little thing and it doesn't toe the line and they're coming at you. So it just yeah. makes everybody just like this and we're Stepford citizens and Stepford politicians. What I need, to be honest, is people within our community to help me out here. I mean, if you want a politics that is more aligned with what we're about, then hello, guys. You know, you're yeah. certainly doing it. But when you, you know, you talked about two different people, uh, groups, you were talking before about the standard Democrats who know we need somebody to win, blah, blah, blah. They're not, the most I'm going to get from a lot of those people is, well, she's actually not crazy. I heard her and she's actually not crazy. I'm still not going to be their choice. But then there are millions of people, a, a lot of young people, because you have a lot of young people, the generation younger than the millennials, they hear me. Because they they grew up with mothers who read these books, exactly. right? Mm. And um, people in spirituality and religion, they hear me. A lot of people of color hear me. And it, so my greater, my greater sadness is over the friends that you said said to you, you're not supposed to go there. We're not political. That's, that's a little more upsetting because... And that's who I'm hoping to reach out to. That's who... I know those exact friends are listening right now. And so thank you for listening. And I appreciate both of you so much for taking a stand here. Oh, yeah. And just it's, you know, even for me, because I do feel so passionately about you as a candidate and the potential for hope in the world for my children, the change that's possible. um, I keep coming back to um, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And like, I want our country to be somewhat happy. It's not happy. People look at our country and they laugh and they're disgusted and they cry over it. And it's, you go anywhere else in the world and they're disgusted. They're disgusted. And um, it's embarrassing, but beyond that, it's just sad. It just breaks my heart. So the friends that are like that, where they're just like in protection mode, and I get that. I get that mama, mama mode 
mama bear, just like put my head down, stay protected. I understand that. But, but that's the re- not mama bear. No. no that, that's not mama bear. That's no. ostrich. That's yeah. not mama bear. Mama bear, you mess with my babies. I'm coming after you. Exactly. And they're messing with your babies. <laughs> That system is messing with their babies. And if it's not messing with their babies, it's messing with the babies on the other side of town or the other side of the world. So that's not mama bear. They yeah. need to be more fierce mama bear. Yeah, I agree. Awesome mama bear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love it. I want to... I want to get the clarification. Sorry. This is literally my, my life is, is helping people who struggle with addiction. And I want to ask the, the kind of maybe, I guess, the direct question. I 100% get, especially having the spiritual um, base that you have, your connection to AA, et cetera. Do you also support all the other um, recovery-based solutions that are either secular or medication-based, et cetera, things like that? You know, I always said in my lectures, I don't give advice. I post questions. Hmm. And that it, it's like my whole thing when people say, oh, you don't, you, you're against this. Or, I've never said I'm against medicine. I've never said I'm against uh, antidepressants. I've never said I'm against anything that anybody, that's just not even, my, my training is in non-judgment. I mean, <laughs> I, I, whatever, if, 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 whatever people find that helps them and gets them wherever they need to go. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. I just, the reason I want to hear that is, um, it's one of his main, well, it's one of my main things. And it's not, that's not always true of everybody who supports traditional recovery is there's this well, notion background. that anything else is dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. My, yeah. My background with recovery when I was a young woman, not that young, I was in my early thirties. I lived with a heroin addict for a couple of years and that was my exposure to that world. And he wasn't sober and I thought he was an NA. And so living with a heroin addict for a couple of years was kind of like the equivalent of a 25 year marriage to an alcoholic, you know, yeah. learned at that time. And then we'd go to Al-Anon meetings during that time. So, and also I have to say AA was, it was more, it was more fundamentalist AA at, at that time. Um, so I have experienced and witnessed the miracles that are available there. But yeah. that's not to say I don't think miracles are available elsewhere. Amen. Um, you know, I'm standing, I don't know if you noticed them behind us, but the, this is my office that we're speaking in. I have these posters, every, every accomplishment. accomplishment. Starts with the decision to try. And then on the other side is why not go out on a limb? That's where all the fruit is. Oh, um, I've certainly gone out on a limb, haven't I? Yeah. Well, I was talking to Sophie before we went on here about that's such a perfect little summary for me of what you're doing right now. Um, you were living in this safe bubble, right? You would get in front of people and you would speak and they would cheer you and go, Oh my God, we love Marianne. And then they would text you after and follow you everywhere. And you'd have their email and they would talk to you back and say, how much do I appreciate you? And maybe and- buy a book. Maybe, maybe, buy, maybe a book. buy a book. You've maybe written, donate. You've, you've written a couple of times. Um, and we'll have links, by the way, to all the books in here as well. And oh my God, talk about going out on a limb. <laughs> it's like you're now on the, you know, like you're not even on the main branch. You like went out on the branch that cuts off the branch. It just has one little leaf on it. And you're just like hanging on. And, and yet yeah. every accomplishment starts with the decision to try. And so I wanted to kind of wrap up the political part of what we're talking about here today with, can you explain to our people a vote for you? What is it for? What does that mean that they're standing for if they vote for you? Okay. First of all, we have to, American capitalism must reclaim its conscience. American capitalism has swerved from an ethical core. Starting in 1980, our public economic policy began to advocate for short-term profits for huge multinational corporate entities at the expense of community, at the expense of environment, so that you now have millions and millions of Americans living with chronic economic anxiety. Millions of Americans who don't know what will happen if they get sick, who don't Mm. know what will happen if their kids get sick, don't know how they will send their kids to college, don't know how they'll get out from underneath their college loans. So the first thing we need to do is give a massive infusion of economic hope and opportunity into the life of the average American through repeal of the 2017 tax cut that was $2 trillion, where 83 cents of every dollar were given to the richest corporations and individuals, stopping of the corporate subsidies, uh, negotiating with the drug, uh, big pharma for drug prices, um, looking at military spending, 2% taxes on 
on um, uh, billionaire assets and three percent, three percent on billionaire assets and two percent on those with fifty million and more. Now you do that, and you immediately start to relax the shackles that cap so many people's dreams. Mm. And it will also mean that we will have the money to pay for what we need to pay for. Because in order to unshackle people. Uh, his dreams and unleash people's spirit. They need to have universal health care. We need to have the free college tuition at state colleges and universities. Yep. We need to have relief from the college loans, etc. Then what we need to do are four major items. Number one, we need to rescue millions of chronically traumatized children who live in this country. We have millions of American children. We have 13 million hungry children in the United States. Mm. We have millions of American children who go to school every day and ask the teacher if they have something to eat. We have children in elementary school on suicide watch. We mm. have millions of American children who go to school in classrooms that they don't even have the adequate school supplies with which to teach a child to read. Mm. And if a child can't learn to read by the age of eight, the chances of high school graduation is drastically decreased and the chances of incarceration are drastically increased. We have millions of American kids who psychologists tell us live with a form of PTSD that is no less severe than a returning veteran from Afghanistan or Iraq. Mm. We need to rescue these children no differently than if they were the victims of a natural disaster. That's why I want a United States Department of Children and Youth in order to coordinate. I was reading just in the last couple of days, in this last year alone, tech companies tell us that there were 45 million impressions and videos of violent sexual assault on children. I saw that. So this is so out of control. We need a whole, that's why I want a department of children and youth. That's mm. number, number two. We need a World War II level mass mobilization, the Green New Deal and more, with which to transition from a dirty economy to a clean economy. Because if we do not, within 12 years, we could have a level of social collapse unseen in the modern era. Uh, food shortages, whole swaths of continents that are uninhabitable because of the heat, because food cannot grow there. Massive millions, millions more, possibly even more than millions, environmental refugees, etc. Third, I feel that for a country as well as for an individual, you can't have the future you want unless you're willing to clean up the past. So I believe it's time to pay reparations for slavery mm. and to very serious ways, reparative measures in terms of Native American justice. Mm. And then the last piece of what I think of as a moral integrated politics is that we need to take a serious look at our national security agenda. Because right now our national security agenda is driven by short-term profits for defense contractors so that it, the core principle is endless preparation for war. Yeah. yeah, And there's very little waging of peace. It's like we're in health and wellness, right? You can't just take medicine. You have to cultivate health because sickness is the absence of health. Health isn't the absence of sickness. But our politics, period, but particularly on war and peace, is the old allopathic model. Yeah. You don't cultivate peace. You just wait, right? And then when the symptoms of conflict arise, you seek to eradicate or suppress them. So yeah. I want a department of peace so that the peace building agencies and the peace builders would receive the same level of support that we give to our military and the people who, you know, I I look at the military like I look at a surgeon. If you have to have surgery, of course, the United States should have the best surgeon. There's no question about that. But sane people avoid surgery if at all possible. Absolutely. I love it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, you know, for talking about all those things. The support, I, I look at, you know, education, health, um, and, and security as, as some of those basic, just human rights. Well, especially the basic roles of government. Like that is what, that's why we have government. Um, I agree. The rich, the I rich can, know. why are you guys here if you're not going to help people? Yeah. The, the rich can always get the best doctor. They can always pave their own roads. They can always, they've always been able to do that. That's not an issue. Right. It's for everybody else. If we want anything near an egalitarian society that, that we need care. It's like, you know, that's, that's the role of government. So thank you for saying that so um, succinctly. Yeah, we were raised to believe it was supposed to be that way. I mean, it's supposed to be, as Lincoln said, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. To become a government of a few of the people, by a few of the people, for a few of the people, of, by, and for huge multinational corporate conglomerates. And that's not going to change 
until and unless we the people rise up and change it. And if you're looking to the status quo political establishment to fix it, you know, Donald Trump didn't create all this. Donald Trump yeah. was created by all this. This goes back further than just Donald Trump. So I think it's time for us to, as we would say in our community, set some serious boundaries here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, so we could go on forever with you. We wish we had all day with you. We'll have to well, do that so soon. It's nice to meet you personally. Yeah, so yeah. much, Absolutely. so much. And we ask all our, our um, guests five questions. Okay. So the first is, what is the best advice that you've ever received? Get over yourself. You're not the only person here. Get over yourself. Mm. Trump, if you're listening, please. Um, what has been one of your proudest moments to date? Almost any time my daughter opens her mouth. Mm. Oh, how old's your daughter? 29. Mm. I, I think I feel the same way about all three of our I kids. Bet you do. I bet you do. I've seen pictures. <clears throat> oh, amazing. Um, on the flip side of that, and maybe we talked about some of this already, what has been your hardest moment to date? The death of my parents. Mm. The loss of a couple of loved ones. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, you are probably a master of this. I would, I would like to think as I think I am on good days, um, for self care, what are some of your rituals? Like maybe right now when you're in the thick of it and you know, your days are nuts, like what do you do to just stay grounded? Like I look to you for that. Like when things get crazy, I'm like, whew, I all, a lot of my self care does go out the window. So what are you doing? Sleep is extremely important. Meditation. You know, one of the things that you're aware of on a, on a uh, political campaign is that you can blow it in any moment. So anything, whether it has to do with low blood sugar or not mm. having enough sleep that gets, mm. me, gets my nervous system off is a danger to the project. Yep. Wow. Beautiful. Beautifully said. So sleep and meditation. And then I'm assuming um, it's hard on the road to take care of the, the wellness of the nutrition part as well. Do you, is that something that you have to really watch? Yeah, I, yeah. I do. I do. And I, and I think I am pretty, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing what I've done for the last 35 years, just more of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that the only thing that's dropped by the wayside too much is cardio. Yeah. But I have my traveling yoga mat that I can do in the hotel room, but I'm, I'm, I'm not doing cardio as much as I should. And that would be more. You FaceTime me morning, noon, or night, and I will give you a, the best <laughs> private yoga session of your entire life. You might be sorry you said that. I'll was... throw some cardio in there, Marianne. I love it. Um, finally. This podcast is called Ignited. Um, we care about what it is that ignites people at their deepest core. What ignites you? Love. Love. Same thing that ignites everybody else. Mm. We love you. I love, I love you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you for. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, good luck. We will be here to support. We will be here to get the word out. We'll put all the links to everything that you're doing um, in the show and notes. Best. And we wish you the best. Thank you. And I hope to see you in LA. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Ignited Podcast. We were so happy to have you along for this ride. Please go and subscribe to this. Leave us a review. We love hearing from you. And if you want more, don't forget to go to ignited.com where all the podcast episodes are available with show notes and so many of the little details and links from each one of these interviews. And you can look at all the future events that we have going on, all the things that make Ignited so special, even beyond this recording. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next week.